every single gave a lot of time. We are thankful to him for that. And there were also several new ideas and suggestions about this new emerging challenge in the edible oil industry. We know that uh, the Indian food processing industry has been doing well. The industry has been growing. It has been creating a lot of jobs. But increasingly, we find that uh, even though uh, the domestic industry has been growing, but our share in the uh, global market for processed food remains very low. Remains very low, and there is a bit of dichotomy there. I wanted to write on this alone, but I, I have not done it so far. You know, while uh, in April itself, I wrote that due to heat, uh, excessive heat in the month of March, we may not be able to uh, export the quantity of wheat which was being talked about at that point of time. So I wrote about that. But uh, I'm not really happy with the restrictions on export of wheat flour. In fact, uh, we should be promoting the export of wheat flour. After all, it, for that, processing is done in our country, value addition is done in our country, and if we can create a market for processed food, uh, especially wheat flour, perhaps uh, fortified, then I think India can uh, gain a lot of uh, advantage in several countries in Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, also in uh, in Middle East and Northern Africa. So, uh, food ingredient sector uh, will continue to play a very important role in the growth of food processing industry. And I'm happy that Fiki uh, is hosting this second conference, and, and I'm very sure that a lot of good suggestions will come. Uh, so, I will stop there because we are all very keen to listen to Mr. Singhal what he has in mind, not only about the editor, but also about the process to labeling and a lot of other ideas. We know that uh, uh, FSSAI uh, has been in the news for a variety of reasons for several years. Uh, during the pandemic, I think he got a respite, but I think now that the economy is recovering and movement is uh, returning to normal, I think um, almost every other day there is something or the other written about FSSAI, labeling and other things. We have the task hearing to our asks and uh, it's also been promoting a lot of self-regulation and I think one word which kind of registered very strongly in our head is the trust factor that we talked about and I think that's something which all of you must bear in mind because it is the trust with which the regulator works and that's the bridge between the industry and the regulator and I think that's, that should be really uh, our focus uh, going forward. So with these words, I request you to quite serve to Very good morning to all of you. Mr. Osai was talking about the pandemic period and the respite that we had during that period. I would like to formally acknowledge again before all of you the immense contribution of the food sector industry uh, during the period of the COVID pandemic. We all kept the food supply in price going. There was no shortage of food in the country. That's a great achievement during the tough conditions of the pandemic. We played our role by facilitating you, reducing the number of inspections, getting online certifications from practices, we reduced the compliance burden during that period. But it is a great credit to the entire food industry that there was never any shortage of food during the food time. So hats off to all of you, I salute all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see that Fifty is organizing a series of events and conferences on topics of relevance to the food industry. Today's conference is on ingredients. These are extremely, extremely important. They always have been and they always will be very important. Uh, they play a very important role in product formulation and they perform a variety of functions. Uh, they may provide nutrition, flavor, color, physical stability, and cost of attributes to food products. So we have seen during the COVID pandemic that there has been a major change in consumer processes and behavior. Now, healthy food is something which is divided on consumers and they look at the nutritious value of foods in general. There has also been a shift toward plant-based matrices of foods. And in keeping with the Indian tradition of Ayurveda, 
and leveraging the traditional knowledge of Ayurveda, uh, there is a greater focus on Indian plants and botanicals now. So that is giving an opportunity for newer ingredients to be used. Mr. Sanjay Tadujia and uh, Mr. Sarasa and VST, they told you about the virtues of ingredients. I totally agree with that. Traditionally, ingredients have been very important. But if you look at the innovation that is taking place in this space of ingredients, it is absolutely fascinating. I was just doing a Google search today to see what kind of new ingredients are coming in. And the range is so fantastic. I saw something like flaxseed is X substitutes, which can be used in bakery products. All bakery products can be addressed now because they have the substitute. Uh, there were fruit and vegetable powders that occur a very convenient way to incorporate 100% pure fruit and vegetables into diets. There were meatless flavor additives, which impart the flavor of meat, but they are not meat. There were soy proteins which are soluble and transparent. They can be added to beverages for improving the protein content. There was a garlic paste which doesn't have the smell of garlic. There are all the benefits of garlic but don't have the smell of garlic. They were encapsulated ingredients. They are fascinating. If you encapsulate the particles of sugar, and suppose you are making a chewing gum, and you encapsulate sugar in it, then every time you chew, some sugar will be released. So it's not that all the sugar is released in the very beginning. As you keep on chewing the chewing gum, a little bit will release all the time, gradually it will be released. So very interesting and fascinating new products are coming up, innovation is actually the new scope for innovation and it is happening. Now, when there is innovation, whenever there is any new or novel product, it is globally required by our regulators that former prior approval has to be taken to introduce the new product. And the ingredients which are used in food products have to be listed on the nutrition panel in the, on the product. And uh, the format may vary from the regulator to the regulator, but all over the world, the regulators require that all the ingredients have to be listed on the uh, PDP of the product. Now, new and innovative ingredients, they offer a challenge to regulators. Because regulators have to ensure that the regulatory framework is such that no unsubstantiated or unwarranted claims are made on the product. Consumers are not misled. There is complete transparency in declaration. And uh, in order to ensure this, sometimes we come out with stringent labeling requirements. But it you understood that it is in the interest of the consumer that a regulator comes out with stringent labeling requirements. It is normally we have consultation with the industry and they try to uh, not to increase the compliance burden, we try to promote the of the business. But where consumer requests are involved, there will be instances where they have to come up with some more stringent regulations. And we would always request you to deal with that. As you are aware, FSCCI is mandated to lay down science based standards only, evidence based standards, to regulate the manufacture, sale, import of food. And the ultimate mission we have is to ensure safe and wholesome food for the consumers of the country. So we regulate food ingredients also in the process. There are many, many regulations of FSCCI which impinge upon ingredients. But today, since we are talking about innovation, the most important regulation as far as innovation is concerned is the uh, food safety, nutritional and functional foods regulation. This was uh, enacted in 2016. Recently, we have come up with a very updated version of that. So that has been put in the public domain for comments. Now, for any ingredient, we have safety parameters, horizontal parameters, and we have identity standards, which are the particular parameters. This is the general approach for creating all food products. And our approach now increasingly is to go for more and more focus on horizontal parameters, on safety parameters, and to reduce the number of vertical parameters that we have. That is the general trend we have now. So we will try to club are these standards together, our lower number by these standards. And the definition of ingredient in the regulations of FSCCI, 
is that it is any substance including a food additive used in the manufacture or preparation of food and present in the final product. It is not a catalyst which is not present in the final product. It is present in the final product but possibly in a modified form. So that is the definition of an ingredient. And if you look at the draft Nutraceutical Regulations 2022, several functional ingredients are listed in the regulations. And the claims which can be made against them are also listed. So some claims have been standardized, they can be made without asking the authority and be free to use them. The formats that can be used are also given in the Nutraceutical Regulation. Any ingredient with a history of safe use of up to 30 years in the country of origin or 15 years in the country in India uh, can be approved by us without asking for much data. There is a committee which looks at it and then they will give approval after earlier assigning the uh, proposed food idea. In addition to this, now it was mentioned we have recently come out with the Ayurveda AHA regulations in which we have mentioned the ancient Ayurvedic texts which we rely upon. So if there is some ingredient of food product, Ayurvedic AHA, which is mentioned in the ancient Ayurvedic texts, you can see permission for that also and the Ayurvedic AHA logo for that. The concept is that there would be a committee in the Ayush ministry, but at SSI by itself does not have the wisdom to analyze Ayurvedic products. So there is a committee in the Ayush ministry which advises at SSI. So any application which is received will be referred to them and then we will proceed on the basis of what they recommend. So the traditional ingredients listed in the ancient texts of Ayurveda can also be uh, approved by us. But apart from these two, there can be several food ingredients which are neither covered in the regulations which have been made by this state and nor do they have the history of safe use in any country. For such products, we have uh, a regulation which is called the Non-Specified Foods and Food Ingredients Regulation of 2017. In that regulation, there is a procedure provided for, for any new or novel or innovative product. You can come to the authority with an application giving all the details of the product, the composition of the product, and the clinical trials that you have carried out to establish the safety of the product. If there is no history of safe use, then you have to establish safety by testing it on human beings in a controlled condition. So that kind of data can be brought to uh, FSSCI and the relevant scientific evidence can be submitted and approval can be granted. The idea behind these regulations was specifically to promote innovation in 2017. And we have received several applications, several new products have come to India. For instance, very recently we approved microproteins, which can be used for they are not non vegetarian, but they are part of protein. So, new products are coming and they are getting approved in the country. FSCCI is a completely paperless organization today. For the past one year, I have not seen any physical file. Everything is paperless, all the licenses, all the registrations, they are all electronically done through FOSS calls. So, in keeping with that tradition, we have a system now, electronic system for approval of new products also. It's called Electronic Product and Claim Approval Application System and related to e-pass. So that system has been, it's an online platform which is there now and we will lay down the timelines for various steps involved in the process also so that can be done in a time bound manner. So if you have any new application now for a new product, please go to e-pass. You will find it much easier to uh, get it. If I were to look at the challenges and the problems we face about new ingredients, innovations, uh, what we have observed is that many FDO do not provide uh, information about the purity or the standardization of the ingredients that they are using. Any new ingredient has to be thoroughly analyzed. We need to understand the consequence of that ingredient before they can run the flow. So, consequent analysis is a mandatory thing. Please provide that in future whenever you are trying for a new ingredient. The other issues about the claims which are made about any ingredient. The measures used for establishing the truthfulness of a claim about a product or an ingredient. They should have valid testing protocols, analysis protocols. And they should be completely subjective, objective, they should not be subjective. 
So development of such protocols is an area of interest for the industry. If the industry can get together and design some protocols for testing the truthfulness of claims that are being made about new products, that would be an area of interest. There are many existing ingredients which are being used. If the industry can compile a list of claims, standardized claims, which can be made for these products, and submit that to us, that will again be a welcome thing. We can look at the claims once and for all, incorporate them in the regulations, and then they can be used without any approval. So, this again would be a very objective approach, scientific approach. If you can all get together and do this, we will welcome it. We will have to have a list of standardized claims which can be put in the regulations. Please see if you would like to work on this. If you want to create some forum of cross-discipline platform in which industry, academia and the regulator are also present together to do this, that is also an idea which we are going to accept. We are going to look at that idea. So please see if you want to put up such a platform, we will be open to that idea. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, because the traditional wisdom of IRA, now we are increasingly realizing the benefits of that. So if you were to work on Indian plants and botanicals to develop new products, new ingredients, that would be a wonderful idea. You could fund research in some academic institutions, even academic institutions to do this, uh, and to develop science-based evidence on the usefulness of traditional Indian plants and botanicals. If that can be done in a scientific manner, that would be a very good thing. One more thing I would like to request the industry in general, not only related to ingredients, is to uh, perform some hand-holding and capacity building of the smaller units of us. Uh, when we look at challenges in food safety, for instance, uh, up to 30 to 40 percent of all dairy products which are sold have microbiological infections in the country. Now, that is a serious problem. It arises because on the small halwa in the Mihai shops do not train their employees well enough. Hygiene is not observed properly. So when we go to the unorganized sector, the smaller units, we find this to be more of a problem. And therefore the larger units, units have a responsibility of they can, can do some handholding and train or build the capacity of small units. As an association, I think you have to take care of the smaller units also apart from the bigger units that you have. So the customer building over there is required. We have a scheme called FOSTAC in which we train food safety supervisors. But uh, if you can motivate the smaller units to undergo FOSTAC training, that would be so wonderful. Because hygiene issues are more prevalent at the smaller levels. They are less prevalent in zero plants. So that is an issue to which I would like to draw attention. So let me conclude by saying that self-compliance to regulations and science and evidence-based claims and initiatives to create science and safety-based databases to help the industry and the regulator would go a long way, these three things would go a long way towards development of safe, good, innovative, good ingredients. Uh, we have three more sessions scheduled today really uh, tells how much from a commodity it has moved up the uh, scale. The first thing that we would uh, try to achieve by the end of the session is uh, how can ingredients can not only match up the global standards, can also move forward. So that's that's one of the key objectives that we will discuss today. Second, how can we support from an ingredient space, how can we support the entire heat right movement that that is now uh, being started uh, by various bodies and government is really uh, invested to this idea. A third is how food ingredient per se can really influence all of health and wellness. So those are the three areas which broadly we'll touch upon. However, we'll touch upon much more uh, as we uh, as we move forward in this conversation. Just to give you a context uh, with regard to the food ingredient space. Uh, yesterday, uh, Tarun and I, we were in a, in a, in a forum where uh, it was music curious to hear that today some, you know, the senior people, both in the government and also the bodies like uh, the established bodies, they are thinking about 
how India can become the food factory for the world. That's a that's a very very massive uh, uh, step one is really looking forward. So uh, if that has to happen, ingredients has to really uh, make a big move to really support this idea. So so indeed we have a capability to become a food factory for the world, and that's something we will discuss during our conversation. Second. Uh, if you look at the R&D expenditure of major ingredient companies, it's growing in excess of 10 percent. A lot of innovation is happening from the ingredient space, whether be flavors, fragrance, hardcore ingredients. A lot of investment and R&D is uh, is really uh, being put in this ingredient space, and that's really driving a lot of food innovation today. Uh, third, I think. Uh, um, Mr. Singhal had spoken in his forum in terms of how the food industry came together to ensure that during the difficult COVID time there was no food shortage in the country. I think all of us worked together as one unit to ensure that there is a lot of uh, there's no one suffer for food in this uh, in this difficult period. Uh, last couple of things uh, I think in terms of uh, in terms of growth as India is a uh, Still, I would say that uh, the penetration levels compared to other developed countries, we are still at small pace. The so more and more uh, India consumes processed foods, ingredients is going to play a very, very major role because a lot of innovation will happen. People will ask for specialty ingredients that would really uh, meet the consumer expectation. Uh, so overall, I think we, it's, it's, uh, we are at the cusp of a big uh, change that we all will see in the future. And to that extent, uh, today we will have a conversation in terms of what can uh, influence uh, this journey and then how we can really win the consumer heart uh, is really the overall objective. So those, now, those are some of the opening comments. I know uh, we have a great uh, uh, you know, in a panel. I'll just introduce uh, uh, the panel uh, to you. I know all of them have established credentials, but I would uh, probably touch upon in terms of uh, what are the softer sides. I have personally seen, if you start with uh, Mr. Satish Rao uh, on to my left. Nowadays, in fact, I would want to take an, uh, you know, a signature for one of his uh, top selling book, uh, Can I Fly? Indeed, that the book is flying for sure. You can really uh, go for reviews in Amazon. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's amongst the top seller today. But that apart, I think, uh, is going to driving force in the ingredient uh, flavors, fragrance space. He's an industry leader, and people look for his guidance uh, on various aspects in this particular uh, uh, space of ingredients. Thank you a lot, Sudesh, uh, for joining us today. And to my right, Tarun, who doesn't need much of an uh, introduction, but uh, uh, you know, I think at some point of time in 2013 or 14, he was awarded uh, recognized as an economic. Uh, and young Turk visionary uh, uh, leader, and indeed uh, it's been a great journey uh, for a long time. Uh, in terms of FMCG, I think uh, uh, the end B to C uh, perspective he has phenomenal uh, experience and leadership in that arena. Uh, his contribution uh, and his idea, advice and guidance would be extremely valuable for us from an ingredient perspective. And we have Mr. Grover uh, joining us online. Uh, I, I'm not able to see him on the screen, but uh, uh, it's coming. <coughs> he's there. Okay. Hello, sir. I hope you're doing well. Uh, uh, you know, he's been an industry veteran for almost uh, more than 20, 25 years. Uh, he's got a wide experience in India and many and been in uh, many markets. He has got a wide global expertise with regard to the space. So we have a very established panel. Without uh, wasting much of a time, we can straight away uh, move on to the discussion. Anything that you would like to start, sir? Uh, I think uh, a lot has been said, and uh, what better than what we heard uh, from the uh, speakers in the opening session, uh, Mr. Arun Singhal and Mr. Salaj who said talking about it. And I think uh, one of the things that I have learned in the last two years is uh, uh, about uh, the food we eat is what we are, and, and food is your best medicine, food is your health. Yes. So, food is what we clearly are, and I, I think, uh, especially, and I, 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 I think I, 
I have talked about it in the past and I believe in it more so because in 2020 when the uh, you know when the pharmaceutical uh, companies, healthcare industry were looking for solutions to COVID, uh, the best bet was immunity. The best bet was how do you fight uh, the external challenge that people face was uh, what is your immunity and where did your immunity come from was your uh, lifestyle of course, the sleep and exercise and the food you ate. So food has uh, you, know, you know played an important role in the health and well-being of, uh, of uh, humanity and as we uh, develop more and more, I mean the weapon index is a fun function of health and lifespan and clearly food, the importance of food is becoming more and more eminent. And uh, as science progresses, as we look at more and more, uh, you know, world, we are sometimes going back to the original things that why did an in Indian thani exist? Uh, you know, you have a Gujarati thani and a South Indian thani, and why did they really exist? There was a series of stuff that was already there that we needed a balanced diet, and then each one car carried a certain set of ingredients which had a role in the OMB. And therefore, uh, a lot of going back to the past, uh, you know, uh, the CEO of FSI mentioned, uh, the, you know, Ayush Ahar kind of thing. So we are going back to the old wisdom, we are using science and I think uh, the cusp of both of these uh, is really the, you know, the benefit of one day science and the uh, traditional knowledge. I think they put together provide us a big opportunity of what we can do with food how to make this food uh, relevant uh, for a, a healthier life that uh, we expect all uh, consumers to have. And that's really where it is coming from. And it all starts with having the right ingredients, uh, consistent ingredients, and uh, things that you can trust and uh, add to your food and make them more important. So therefore, uh, I, and what better way to have this conference on this uh, agenda? Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Tarun. Uh, so, this just uh, start with before I ask the other five questions to you. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, okay, uh, I, I would take this moment basically to 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 sort of uh, uh, think back on what uh, our FSSA CEO mentioned today, Arun Singh, and also also in the session in the morning. First of all, for all of us, it's song to our ears where the whole regulating ecosystem in India has come such a long way from sort of prevention approach to almost saying that how can we collaborate. I think that itself is a great uh, uh, message to all of us and especially him telling today that self-regulation is the best way. So there's nobody else to regulate uh, for you. You guys regulate yourself. I think that, that speaks a lot about where India has evolved over, over the few decades. Number one. Number two, Prakash, what you just mentioned is how can India be the food factory of the world? What a great vision. Uh, we don't need to be the first populated country in the world. That's okay. But then with the kind of centuries of heritage we have got, whether it's called it as Ayurveda, whether it's called as uh, uh, heritage foods, whether it's called as diversity food, which Tarun is talking about, we have a huge repository of knowledge in this country. How can all the elements or all the... Uh, uh, players of this industry come together to really take this brand India to somewhere which probably, is, for example, how Scotland is famous for Scotland, or Australia for wines. But there's so many things, why can't India capture that space? And we've got our, probably all the elements, we just need to stitch it together. I think that is super critical. And the third point I would like to mention is, thanks to COVID, uh, we probably realize the importance of immunity. We realize the importance of our own well-being, uh, and it forced us uh, to think through our health and wellness, which probably we were taking a bit uh, taken for granted approach. And that itself creates a huge industry for, uh, for us in this ingredient space, that health and wellness is such a huge space that each one have their own nice uh, sweet spot to operate from. I think these are the three things which really came out. I'm just uh, reflecting on the morning session and amazing, amazing, super, super uh, excited about that. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. Thank you very much, Prakash. Sorry, uh, I missed this opportunity to be there, you know, in person. Uh, so far as my initial comments are concerned, I think there are, I mean, we heard in the morning, uh, Mr. Singer, and there are a few key basic drivers 
you know, from consumer perspective, uh, which are who are you know driving the innovation in ingredient segment. Uh, food safety is one, uh, sustainability and pollution. You know, customer today is looking for you know the products whether these are clean for me, if it is clean for me, whether it is clean for the planet or not. Uh, the other driver is social media and digitalization. All of us know that, and uh, this has got accentuated, you know, since start of pandemic. So I don't need to elaborate more on this. So the other drivers are like urbanization, uh, localization. That necessarily, you know, many first thing to if I see look at, you know, final product perspective. Customers are looking at convenience. They don't have time. I mean, their friend and wife both are working. And they are looking at indulgence, you know, any any food experience has to be, you know, memorable experience for them. And then from nutrition side, health and nutrition side, you know, specific life steps, nutrition, malnutrition and the performance of the nutrition. So some of these, you know, drivers are basic, you know, at the, at the core, which are driving today the, you know, changing needs of our consumers. Over to you, Prakash. So, just raise your hand and then uh, you know, I can come to you. Maybe I'll start with the first uh, you know, question to uh, Tarun. Tarun, we have been discussing about the food factor of the world and it is indeed a great uh, uh, vision to have. Uh, what are your thoughts? How can we really become a food factor of the world and how can we be a leading player in, in, uh, from a global perspective? What, what should we do as, a, as industry? What should we do as ingredient uh, manufacturers, and also what we should do from a B two C F M C D perspective? Can I have a thoughts, please? Uh, thanks. It's a great question, Prakash. Uh, because uh, I think uh, the starting point is that can we be really a food factory to the world? Uh, I think one important ingredient to being that is having sufficient resources in this country. I think we are uh, the largest producer of dairy and several other agricultural products. Uh, we are, we have all the right, uh, you know, inputs to be that. Uh, but what is really holding us participating in the uh, food uh, conversations globally, rather than just being some curry uh, space in uh, uh, in Britain, which is uh, you know made up from through the cultural shifts and some un some other things. I think uh, what we need is two or three things which will, my view, uh, make a substantial effort, uh, uh, I mean, which will make a substantial difference in uh, becoming a food factory to the world. One is, of course, uh, innovation. And innovation, I, I don't mean uh, just say for the innovation because uh, our ability to, uh, you know, innovate, provide new things. Uh, relevant to the target markets, uh, which are in their taste. So uh, there are examples of international companies who said they will change the taste of India uh, in certain ways. Some of them have done it beautifully well, and I think those are good, great learning. Uh, the fact is that pizza is as much Indian as it is Italian and it is, it is, it is American. Uh, so the source may be Italy, but America consumes a lot of it. Europe consumes a lot of it. India has a huge, uh, you know, huge consumption of pizza. Now, how has that really happened? It is because there is a certain amount of localization, certain amount of uh, innovations locally that some of the people have done. So, if we want to take Indian food outside, I think conforming to the to their taste well is, is very very important. Innovating around those is very very important. The other thing, of course, is uh, uh, you know taking Indian food there and, or adapting some of their food with our ingredients. So I think opportunities exist in both the spaces. Uh, it is just the vision and imagination, innovation, and the business idea of the uh, of the you know entrepreneur. But those are one uh, part that I would say. Uh, in, uh, the second thing that I think, which is very very important, and uh, which will make a big difference to this country is uh, around uh, trust, confidence, consistency. A lot of uh, historical uh, you know, reasons have been that 
they are having a lot of cases in the past of penetration or of not being building enough trust. I think this, if India really wants to evolve at a global stage of uh, building trust that I provide uh, very clean, very safe products which conform to the global standards on a consistent basis, where they trust. You know, the fact is that uh, when you take a food ingredient coming from Europe or the uh, US, you have a certain belief that they will ensure a certain standards. Of course, uh, there are people who will betray anywhere in the world, but the fact is that generally you assume a certain minimum standards there. How do we as a country raise our uh, benchmarks to the level to meet the global standards so that somebody says, if it's come from India, we can trust it. Uh, it, it must be uh, good for consumption. So those uh, are the second, uh, if I were to, uh, you know, say. I think these are two or three things that I, of course, one can talk a lot more about it, but to my mind, these two things really stand out, or three things. Conforming to global talent, innovating to be, to meet their needs, and trust and confidence of, uh, you know, having the right ingredients, right things that we commit to them, being consistent in them. Those will really help us in uh, taking uh, the food from India to, to the global place. Uh, maybe uh, Satish may have his own views as well. Uh, yeah, sure, I think it's very well said that you do need to first develop an ecosystem uh, to, to gain that credibility and gain that trust. Uh, and I think very well captured that A, you need to have that foundation uh, in terms of innovation that needs to be done. You need to have that product and then you need to build that uh, uh, trust. I just wanted to add one more to the to completely agree to on one more thing is uh, how can we leverage our core capability? When I say R is India as, as an entity, to, to further this vision, what you're talking. I just want to give one, one very simple example, just to bring home the point that we can do it. It's just a matter of how to bring the elements together. Uh, being, being a part of the fragrance and flavor uh, industry, I'll just give you an example of our own industry, where we make extract oils from flowers or perfumes. Now, look at the thing which existed here, which even I was wowed, that a farmer plick, uh, plucks the jasmine from a Tamil Nadu district, which is extracted, goes to France, gets converted into the essential oil, and then gets into the perfume which you use. Look at the technology this industry has built. Through this QR code, actually when you go, to, go back to that perfume bottle, click on that, you actually see which particular district has grown that jasmine. Not only that, it also shows the pictures of the farmers living in that house who are planted. Look at the connector. Look at it. Now, just take this example one step forward. We are a spice rich company, uh, country. Imagine this doing for chilies, for turmeric, for uh, cardamoms, which goes all the way over there. That's the way you add value. A, we need to have that ecosystem. And B, imagine somebody buying spices in, in, in the Western world, knowing exactly from which farmer has taken it. And we all know that this is almost like an enigma to the Western consumers, right? Now, here is the country which is good in technology which is good in agriculture, which has the Torah of uh, resources, we just need to connect it, and wow, what a brand imagery you create. I'm just trying to give, there are simple tactics which we can use. To, of course, you need to have the foundation first, but we do have all the elements to create the wow factor to the global audience, and once hundreds of this comes together, why should we not become the uh, uh, biggest uh, food factory of the world? Absolutely, great thought, with, and great thought, and uh, you know the, the example that you quoted was really phenomenal. Maybe I'll uh, go to Mr. Grover now uh, with a question, uh, Mr. Grover. One other thing, I think, uh, while we have this ambition of uh, making the food factory of the world uh, dream executed, what do you think are the key challenges? Uh, what are the alternate mechanisms mechanisms that we should have to get the uh, raw materials into the country? What are the Various challenges do you think we should overcome to make it more competitive? Hey, I get muted uh, when that it's okay. So, uh, thanks, Pankash. Uh, uh, thanks for this question. Uh, I think there are a few things I will touch upon uh, while answering this question. Uh, you know, we really, really want to become, you know, global leader. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a we have a initiative you know making India already on 
now since start of this pandemic, there is something different which has come up. All of us know that China plus one. That is, we have the opportunity now, whether it is you know finished products in food uh, industry or ingredients, you know, uh, to be hub for exports from India. Uh, however, let's not undermine that we would be competing with the likes of you know Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, or even Australia and Japan. So it's, we will have to work on it if we really, really want to grab this opportunity. Good thing is that government is working on it. We have seen that government has given certain PLIs in certain you know uh, ingredients uh, segment, for example, in pharma for APIs to reduce our dependence from China. Now, so far as raw material is concerned, uh, Prakash, uh, our challenge is we are a non-GMO country, right? And that restricts our options. If I take, for example, uh, example of my industry, wherein, you know, we process uh, corn, uh, we, we, there are two or three countries globally which have non-GMO corn available. And unfortunately, one of those countries is Ukraine, which is right now in a difficult situation. So, if we really have to, you know, be competitive and, and uh, you know, make, make India export us, we will have to look for alternate botanicals. If I take example of Rocket Global, not India, we, we have four commodities which we are processing. It's a wheat, corn, pea, and potato. That means to an extent, you know, we are backing up if one crop fails, the other crop can help us. But in India right now, we have that constraint. Most of the starch industry today is processing corn oil. Uh, also, I would say that uh, in order to, you know, uh, in order to facilitate export as well as import of ingredients, uh, you know, uh, we need to have more you know, trade packs, for example, government has recently signed trade pact with UAE government. That means it will facilitate both sides. They will be advantage to us in terms of import, uh, you know, in terms of export duty as well as UAE, UAE will have advantage in terms of, you know, export duty for them to India. But we need more of these with countries with association like ASEAN or European Union, uh, because most of the Indian imports or even exports are happening either in Southeast Asia or China. So those are some of the things government is working on. At the way we, we got success in UAE, I'm sure, you know, similar facts we will have with, with other, other countries also. Uh, last but not the least, you know, finally the solution lies we have to manufacture these specialities ingredients in India. And what we lack, at least, you know, I'll give example from my industry, is technology. If I look at starch industry, we are still, you know, limited to very, very basic products. So far as, you know, value-added specialities are concerned, there is lack of technology. We will have to bring this technology, and that technology will come through collaboration with global players. Uh, and in addition to bringing in technology, we will have to invest more. You mentioned that you know in certain in probably in some of the uh, ingredients uh, areas the investment in R and D are as high as ten percent, but that may not be true in all the you know all the ingredient uh, industries in India. But at least I can say that for starch industry, that's probably not the case. So we will have to invest more in R and D innovation and work closely more with our customers and academia to develop innovative and value-added solution. At the same time, last, my last uh, comment on this, if we have to compete, you know, we will be competing with the likes of China. That means uh, they have scale, they have competitive, you know, cost competitiveness. So unless, you know, you have scale, I mean, anything we develop in India, even if let's say speciality, uh, we have to consider that we would be selling that in Indian market as well as it has to be exported. Because if you look at standalone India market, probably speciality per capita consumption is not as high as you will see in countries in Southeast Asia, China or European country. So we have to keep in mind that whatever we do, we have, if we have to, you know, we will have to be cost competitive. And to do that, we will have to keep not only just consumption in India, 
uh, you know, export from India also. All these challenges are opportunities in disguise. Uh, we, we all know that, but we need to overcome it uh, one by one. So let us get into the nuts and bolts uh, in terms of what, what are those things which we all, as an institution, can address, which can only make our life easy. Let me give you one example. Uh, all of us here uh, do supply ingredients to some other company, to some other entity. And we all, we all know that when there are, there are individual substances which are coming under category 99, we all know that. But then when there is a combination of the substances, uh, it just gets classified as property. And then you have to go through the entire nine yards. An example is, could we look at maybe creating another category as 100 or something like that, where we don't, the, the regulatory team does not have to go through all this. I'm sure I can see some regulators, uh, regulator uh, team here uh, smiling. Uh, can we can we get into something like that, which will only make our job easy? Uh, number two is uh, we all know that as as a part of self-regulation, we need to get our our, our products or samples tested twice in a year. Great step forward from where it is before, but guys, all of us have have thousands of products which we give to customers. Doing that each individual one twice in a year, each cost maybe 20, 25,000 rupees. Ultimately, we all pass this on. We all know that that's that's the nature of the game. It only adds to the inflation. Ultimately, the consumer buys it. Now, when we are talking about an era of self-reliance, can we at least make it maybe once in a year or maybe nothing? Do it a self-declaration, uh, and if somebody is uh, held or somebody is caught with the deviation, you put up a huge penalty, which is a deterrent. So these are steps which are very positive, proactive in approach, but reduces this whole. Uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, work which we are just doing work to churn our own uh, uh, stuff and helps us to focus on more productive stuff. In fact, I was just seeing Google in the morning that we have jumped 23 steps as a country to become now 23 steps to become 77th uh, in terms of ranking out of 190 countries in ease of doing business. Why can't we even top them? These are the things which, which just strangulates us. When we import some uh, samples from abroad because all of us we being part of the global uh, organizations, uh, it's not easy. Yes, from 100% sampling, now it has come down to 35% sampling. But if those 35% takes 10 to 15 days and time is money. So again, for good governance companies like all of us who are represented here, why can't we give a self declaration saying that we abide by these rules and uh, take a random sample and if it is caught, let's address it. But don't, let's not waste the Indian economy time of two to three weeks, which is actually a burn, burning a hole in the economy. So the point here is that a lot of these kind of hurdles, which automatically can be uh, can be uh, taken out. Uh, in fact, in the, by the morning, we are also discussing on this whole negative list coming to positive list. Yes, that's a great step. But what about those new molecules which have been invented by uh, global incorporations? Again, you have to go through the same thing for all. Uh, can't, can't, if that has already been done by the JIPFAS and the Fimagras of the world, uh, can we just leverage that? And we, I'm sure it will be heard. But these are the things which are all forward-looking. We need to get get into that. These are challenges. But are these huge hurdles deal breaker? Not at all. But I'm sure this kind of organization, this kind of uh, events which uh, uh, organizations like Fiki is organizing, is a platform to bring to the attention of the regulators. Hopefully, to make our life less cumbersome, so that we focus more on adding value to our stakeholders. I'll ask uh, put a question to Tarun and then we'll get some uh, feedback uh, from Satish as well. From a, from a B2C perspective, uh, you know, you are, uh, you are leading one of the uh, most iconic uh, organizations in India. What is your uh, expectation with regard to uh, ingredients? What, from a stakeholder point of view, what do you think that Indian industry can uh, offer you so that uh, the FMCG organization can, can be really meeting the consumer uh, expectation. Robert, Mr. Gover, I'll, I'll come to you in a minute after this. Sure, sure. So, so from a, you know, we, we have a product with those ingredients like uh, sugar free, but uh, yeah, we, we consume a lot of uh, ingredients which go into our food products. And uh, uh, from my perspective, the way I would look at it from a, uh, you know, to see perspective, what we would expect, uh, you know, our partners to work on is consistency. I think one of the things, important things is that uh, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't dis I mean, I, I 
thoroughly agreed with when Mr. Senior was talking this morning about uh, uh, self-regulation, trust, a lot of these, uh, you know, when the products come in with a uh, certificate of uh, in the CUEs, CUEs. So, so that is a much bigger thing and we would really, you know, rely a lot on so there are two parts so on it. As supplies, can I get a consistency and uh, and trust-based uh, system, which uh, Satish talked about I also, uh, where uh, we can just go with whatever we are told. Because your lab, my lab is the same thing. If we've done that, we don't. We shouldn't be needing to test it. Uh, there are situations when we have had to. You know, of course, with the larger partners, it is less often. But there are situations, and therefore that would be one. The biggest uh, expectation I have with all partners, and I uh, encourage some of my colleagues, some of them are sitting here as well, is that uh, I don't see them as only somebody who's giving us products to put in our, uh, you know, final products, but as partners to help us evolve into meeting our consumer needs. Finally, we all work for the consumers. Consumers, you know, pay our salaries, pay our living, they buy our products. Then only we have our business, and we will do a much better service. Our businesses will grow together if we work on innovations, product development uh, with our partners. Where I think food ingredients, uh, there is so much of knowledge, uh, capability sitting there. How are we, you know, leveraging that to the max? Uh, you know, and uh, use these to build uh, better and superior solutions for the consumer. So I'm not seeing. Just food, but I'm seeing solutions because they are looking, they are taking food not just for uh, uh, reason of satiety, uh, but also for what it does for them. And therefore, what can we do? You know, the basics is that we, we give you consistent quality and reliability of supply. Those are given, I mean, that is nothing value addition, I would say, somebody is doing if you are meeting those expectations. The value addition comes, you know, working closely with uh, customers like you and developing, you know, new solutions which add value to your business as well as add value to our business. Uh, Prakash, coming to these challenges for the industry, if I take, you know, example of our starch industry, you know, the biggest challenge today we are facing is on raw material side. Uh, you know, if, if you look at, for example, corn, it was moving at around 18,000, it has moved up to 23,000. The reasons? One, of course, it is a very, I hope it is a temporary, it will go out soon, the conflict between Russia and, Russia and, uh, and uh, China. The other reason, of course, is, you know, uh, uh, we know that agriculture in India is based on monsoon, it is based on, you know, substitute crop, for example, sugarcane got food price this year, farmer will shift to. So the, those are some of the challenges we face. And I mentioned earlier that unfortunately we are non Fortunately or unfortunately, I won't comment on that, we are non-GMO, so we have very limited option to even to import the raw materials. Uh, hello, my name is Parthra Patil Dash. I head a consulting firm based in Delhi. It's in the space of market entry and technology commercialization, focusing on food sector. Uh, coming to the previous session, there were two deliberations made. One was that focus on Indian plants and biologicals. Second was hand-holding the unorganized sector. We talk about beneficiaries in terms of the plant ingredient that we're talking about, but in the supply chain, there's a huge dilution, significant dilution of the active ingredients, phytochemicals. How to address that? That's number one. Second is, in terms of the traceability aspect, even if a farmer in India has the stringent measure in terms of growing a plant and exporting it globally, he faces that issue or challenge of contamination because the water he uses or the land, the soil he uses is contaminated. So how to get rid of these two challenges when we look at the broader unorganized market, being industry leader, what's your view on that? Thank you. Right. Yeah. Maybe I'll take the second part uh, of the question, and then, uh, uh, and then maybe I'll uh, we can we can have discussion. One other thing, uh, uh, 
about a traceability part. In fact, there is a lot uh, of work happening even at a ministry level in terms of uh, how do you really equip a small farmer uh, to be made aware of the right, uh, you know, uh, I'm just using this word manufacturing process. Yesterday, in fact, uh, Tarun and I were in one of the, you know, conversation where uh, where it was music to years to hear that the government has set up significant budget to see how uh, we can educate the small farmers. If example, uh, like for example, there was an example made uh, uh, demonstrated yesterday that a flower that is uh, plucked in Hosur at the morning 4 a.m. goes to Bangalore at 6 a.m. takes a flight to Europe, whichever destination, say by Indian time 12, 12 30 which is early morning Europe, and then it is uh, delivered early morning to any of the European market. So from a logistic point of view, it's well taken care of. But the question that you're asking is, if someone looks at the traceability and someone looks at, uh, I'm just giving an example of a flower, but if it's a food product, people would look at what sort of uh, you know pesticides are going in and so on and so forth. That is where probably uh, we, uh, as a forum, we need to really do a lot of work to help the small manufacturer uh, be made aware of uh, these practices that would really help on two things. One, the yield can be far better. Second, when you want to be a food factory for the world, these are the fundamentals for you to be at this. Uh, I'm not saying uh, as a country we are at it, but I think uh, there are right steps being taken to see how we can educate. Uh, I hope uh, it clarifies uh, your second part of the question. With regard to the first part of the question, probably. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I'll take on to the first part of the question. Uh, in terms of, I think it's a, it's a great question you asked. That's 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 precisely the fundamental challenge in a country like India, where mm -hmm. bigger parties are not the less, and how do you, how do you get them into the system? Really, I was thinking I would really answer it with three T's, which is mission critical uh, to bring this together. The first one is the technology. Uh, because one thing, let's admit, no one entity or no one person, no one company, no one institution can do this together. Let's get that straight. So the first one is technology. Uh, just want to give an example. Ten years back, the farmers whom, from whom we were sourcing, 90% of those farmers were commensurated with cash. That's how it was given. Today, 95% of the same farmers are accepting digital payments. Look from where to where it has gone. What has this brought about? How a technology can be infused in one part of the value chain, which can create completely transformation in terms of way of doing business. So that's the first key. The second one is the transparency. If the whole elements of the value chain is transparent to the end consumer, or even to the end customer, somebody like what Karuna is talking about, where these are the guys who run big brands, that that brand knows exactly at every step of the state, whether it's a small farmer, whether it's a mandi, whether it's a wholesale market, whether it's a shipping and logistic agent, where he gets, it gets complete transparency across the entire value chain, automatically brings you a third team, which is a trust. Which is a trust on that system, trust on that brand, trust on that whole ecosystem. And once you have these three in place, automatically you take this entire ecosystem to the next level. But can it be done by one person? No, it requires technology enablers, it requires ingredient manufacturers, it requires brands, it requires socio-economic, it requires NGOs to work with it. And probably networking of all this ecosystem into platforms like this can create the magic. But it's extremely important. Well, thanks a lot. A uh, couple of more questions, anyone? Yeah, on the right, yes, please. Hello, so this is Apran. This is a plan from Dawson, your startup. So I want to bring in some perspective and then a call of question. We talk about food factory for the world, making India a food factory for the world. We talk about resources, we have the resources. We talk about innovation and R&D, how much we are investing as a country in R&D. And we talk about all of these. So the perspective is we are working in plant-based protein and Right now we have one of the biggest rice you know, growers in the world, we have huge maize and we need these maize and rice for the starch. So what is left behind is the protein, right? 
So we are a company that has made those feed quality protein to a human grade protein. So we have improved the levels of like protein that was extracted, like rocket is extracting the protein. I was, they must be doing it of 45% protein content. We have done it to 80% protein content and that is functional human grade. So the question is, what can companies like you can do with companies like us, the startups, and how can you supplement our r and I'll also, you know, uh, want to tell that we are already working with uh, University of Minnesota, the same department that has brought in uh, Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug. We are working with them. They are like very happy with the findings, and we can actually, you know, change the entire dynamics of protein-based, you know, in, in like plant-based protein in, in India. Uh, other innovation centers like like yours, uh, you know, in order to there were two challenges we were facing in terms of space, as well as the another challenge which we have is probably we will have to resolve going forward is the cost of you know uh, proteins, plant proteins. So we are more than happy. We are already you know we, we can get in touch offline. We are already working with a lot of startup companies in the area of pea proteins right for alternative for me and we will be very happy to work with you also so i request you let's get in touch with each other we are more than happy because right now we are at a stage we are kind of building the ecosystem for you know plant-based proteins so uh, maybe uh, i we can we can touch base uh, and uh, we can talk more about it yeah but already we are working with that. organizations like you on this from a technical perspective as proteins as such uh, it has a lot of off orders, it has a lot of off taste. So, so flavor houses like us uh, actually demasket and make the food taste better. So what, what content you have, you just make it more tasty and palatable. Uh, so bring it on. Okay. And all the best to you for all your viewers. Uh, we are almost... Uh, any, any more questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sir, I am Dr. Himanshu from Ascension Loop. So basically the, the point which is going to attack in this forum is that connecting people and touching the life, like handholding the startups and how we can do better. So I find that there is a big need to you know, advocate regarding a regulatory change. Whenever a new ingredient comes into the market, the company has, is not allowed to present their own case. The regulator presents our case to the scientific committee and there the challenge has come, the innovation dies in between. So, like in case of a DCGI or the drug, where the companies put their case and the scientific committee members understand their challenges and their advantage that provide a landmark and a changes in the innovation. So, I advocate from this kind of platform that we should uh, ask the regulator to make certain changes in their policy matter and the administrative. Yeah. So as a B2C brand, uh, we are also very much dependent on the ingredient suppliers for all our raw materials. And we have seen shortages of oils and starches uh, due to Corona and uh, for the and in terms of wars that are happening in the country. So what are your, uh, like what, what is the future plans if situations like this come in the future? So how is India sustainable enough for such kind of challenges? Mr. Grover, can we get your feedback on this? What is the question? That India is, you know, net importer of edible oils. We are importing almost, you know, 50% of our edible oil requirement uh, importing from Malaysia, Indonesia. So these countries have been passing through difficult phase. So that is what has, that, you know, led to increase in edible oil prices in last, you know, few quarters. That you can, you must have seen recently. Government has abolished duty on edible oils, and also government is taking all the initiatives to curb the price price increase in edible oils because this is directly linked to inflation. It's a politically sensitive product. Number one, number two, in terms of starches, you are right that uh, uh, India is for last if I look at one and a half years or two years, India is exporting a lot of starch and derivative products. Roughly, we were exporting 20,000. This 20,000 has gone up to 70 to 80,000 because we, India is competitive vis-a-vis China. However, the situation is slightly changing now. 
probably in the in next few months we will start seeing that uh, our uh, exports are not going to be as competitive because china corn is coming down uh, us corn is coming down so we may not be as competitive as today we are so what i see is unless you know the new crop of creep which will come in up to that that is you know substantially lower prices otherwise we will not be able to export and all that will be available for domestic market and situation a supply situation in domestic market will improve and at the same time within health wellness and nutrition each company is looking at very specific areas uh, to focus on uh, specifically now if i uh, talk to you prakash uh, with iff 2.0 you know coming together i would like to know individually from each of you uh, what are the aspects that within health and nutrition that each of your company is looking at not from a long term perspective but from a short and medium term perspective okay since you have uh, specifically put uh, my organization into into the question uh, <laughs> primarily uh, i think the way in which i would like to put is uh, there are three key drivers uh, that uh, that is in my view common for everyone whether it is uh, whether it is iff or any other organization be it even b2c there are three things that are important one is everyone is looking at sustainability uh, so that is a uh, taken uh, so how can we really uh, give products that are more sustainable and so on and so forth so that's one first area second like it or not everyone is speaking health today uh, not a day time conversation it's a 24 hour conversation uh, brands are saying how can if if i everyone is thinking how my brand should not be considered as a baddie and some sort of health element the brand should stand for so there is some sort of a purpose each brand is trying to uh, position in the market so a lot of health is is dominating the conversation uh, predominantly in any of the uh, uh, any of the uh, opportunities that come in our way the last is all about experience because good food should also taste good to that extent uh, you know we had uh, arun singh speaking this morning about uh, you know the chewing gum should release the sugar at a right time and uh, various aspects in the flavor business that we speak on a day in and day out it's all about experience uh, so until and unless the consumers really love the product there is hardly no business that they speak about so uh, so if this is what is reality for us speaking about sustainability speaking about health speaking about the experience the consumer experience i think these are the three pillars in which uh, most of the uh, action is happening at least uh, from an industry point of view it it can be executed in a way by iff i am sure it is executed in a way differently by kerry or it could be by formulas or so on so forth that is my take on it uh, maybe i'll leave it to karan if you want to add a comment so so i i i'll obviously have a very different view because uh, not necessarily agree with you on uh, business but for about how we looking at health and wellness fortunately for us uh, uh that is wellness most of our brands whether uh, you know what we built from zaidis or we acquired uh, eventually also we all have a pedigree of being category builders or coming into life by uh, by a pharma company innovating into a consumer space whether you look at sugar free you look at uh, burgundy uh, compliance so they met a specific health need that was relevant for the consumers over the years we've seen the meaning of health and, and therefore there was all science based evidence based over the years uh, meaning of health has been evolving uh, if you look at what nih was saying was rda through i mean 10 years back was different or it has it is sharpening some of those things the need for sugar has changed the need for some of those other ingredients is changing and uh, for us i think if we want to be in a health and wellness we are a consumer business but we are focused on consumers well being and we believe our brands are scientifically designed so we need to offer consumers uh, health and wellness products which are from a contemporary perspective which are meeting their needs of today's lifestyle 
and therefore it means we need to reformulate, go back to the uh, you know uh, the drawing board and make the pro you know products evolve to the changing needs. Uh, and uh, for us, two or three areas of care focuses: nutrition, uh, calories, uh, you know, reducing calories and immunity. If I were to say energy and immunity. Those are areas that we focus a lot of our attention, a lot of our R&D work on, and also uh, uh, consumer insight also. Those are, if I were to say. Tell that, what are his expectations in terms of the timeline? Is that the possible implementation of any of those? Recommendations. Uh, because, you know, otherwise, uh, amazing conferences like these uh, run the risk of, you know, uh, healthy discussions happening, but when it comes on the ground, on the field, then startups like ours, I represent White Cup Dairy Free Foods. We are in the space of pioneering dairy, uh, dairy alternatives. So I wanted to understand, Satish Ji, what are your in intuition factor in terms of implementation of at least some of those uh, wish list of your own? Okay, I don't, uh, so if I'm talking about the tactical recommendations, for example, one of the recommendations I made was instead of having twice a year uh, samples, can we at least bring yes. it down to one? Does it take to bring down the moon for that? Not at all. It's a matter of collaborating, saying that if one is doing something, then two may be possible. It's not a big deal. So we, we could work around. So those are, I would say, tactical. And I'm so happy that today we have a regulatory body who are listening to this, who are, who are absolutely wanting to understand what are your problems. Let's let's work it together. So I'm, I'm damn positive in terms of the environment which we are having. So that's what I call it as the tactical recommendation list or the wish list, as you say. Uh, that can be done, and, and thanks to uh, the, the forums like Fiki who bring these forums together, uh, where we have the CEO Arun Sekhar himself listening to all of us. What can be a better opportunity than that? So I'm I'm pretty positive that that today's India can make this happen. Uh, can it happen 100 percent? We don't know. But is the needle moving in the right direction? Absolutely, no doubt about it. Now coming to talk about the strategic recommendation, like the for example the traceability thing, that will take time uh, because we need big powerhouses, the technology companies, the supply chain companies, the farming companies, the pesticides company, all to work together, and that's a dream. That's, imagine if something like that happens where every single stakeholder in the value chain is completely transparent, technologically savvy, and the end consumer knows exactly where, it's like buying in Amazon, you exactly know uh, which warehouse to which warehouse it has gone. Could we have imagined this three years back, or four years back, not at all. Today, we know where you have to get, uh, delivery boys on which gate of your compound wall. Uh, that's what technology bring in. So that's not a rocket science, but then you need need more companies like this to bring it together. Uh, is it uh, a deal breaker? Not at all. But is it easy? Yes, it's not easy. Maybe I'll go to Mr. Grover for... Uh... Oh, sorry? Mostly we discussed three things. That if we want to achieve the uh, highest goal, then we have to more focus on the quality, we have to more focus on the safety product, we have requirement of R&D and technology for overall making us food happy for international market. And you know, in this era, as you see the international situation, we have a very good opportunity for that. So when I took one by one point, so if we more focus on the quality from the food supply chain, quality start from the, you know, farmer level, growing level. As an industry, everybody have the investment for having the good infrastructure for manufacturing. But where we are getting the food ingredients up to the farmer level. So we have to more focus on that. And as an industry, it is, uh, you know, every time we suppose that it is an online sector. You know, it is not, we are not organizing it. We are not taking it in our loops. You know, farmer, it is all organized. When you will connect with them, there, there are many industries who have good projects with the farmer. You know, in this era, we only procure our ingredient from the mandi level or either it is a uh, processed product when we have the good industry. But when we take the product from mandi, we, as an industry, we have to try to connect with farmer. At least like if you have a five ingredient, ten ingredient, you can connect, uh, you can make a pilot project for hundred farmer for one ingredient. Initially, we can start with uh, working over the quality. So ultimately, when we will have the final product, we will have a good quality. Apart from that, if we talk about the R&D and technology, I was posing that we have very good educational institute, and there is a you know very gap between industry and uh, technology. When I was a student, I was even not aware about 
I just studied this code preservation and all these techniques. But now the things have differently changed. So industry they have the requirement. So my next thing to discuss that we can as an industry associate with at least one educational institute. We can deliver our new challenges to the students. Many uh, universities have a very good lab infrastructure, R&D infrastructure. So if as a company we can't invest in the R&D, we can at least associate with the organization. And they are, they are happy, universities are happy if any industry come to that. Because the students who are the new generation for our food safety ecosystem, they will also understand that what are the need of the industry. They will have the practical things to do for the industry. So uh, I belong to Food Regulation and Compliance Center. We have an organization uh, working for enhancing the uh, food re uh, regulation subjects. We are associated with more than 250 educational institutes in India. And uh, to all students, uh, we are providing the uh, you know trainings uh, for regulatory aspect. That what is the regulatory requirement for them. So you know you will uh, you will see that uh, if any student get bachelor or master degree in the food technology, even less than five percent university have not included the regulatory syllabus in their course, course curriculum. To be from the focus area for the customer as well as for us, uh, one is you know sustainability, right? This is one area. In fact, you know. Uh, Early initiatives on sustainability can give you a new competitive advantage also. When we talk to our customers, more and more customers have started talking about you know sustainability initiatives. They want to know what are we doing. Even some of them want to do certain audits also. As a company, you know, we have taken a target that by 2030, we will reduce our carbon emission by 25%, right? Second topic which we have talked, you know, in various uh, questions and discussions today is traceability issue. You know, today, let's say I want to expose something to Southeast Asia to a multinational company, they want traceability. Maybe traceability is possible in certain areas, certain raw materials, but in India it is not possible. At least, let's say, if I take example of corn, it's not easy because most of the buying is happening from Monday. Now, we have taken certain initiative to buy from the farmers. So, coming back, Prakash, I think some of these areas are going to be buzzwords, traceability, sustainability. That is a quick yeah, 10 second stuff. In COVID, I remember my personal example, my mom made kashayam to me saying that uh, that will keep your throat uh, sterile and clean. My uh, local chemist gave me some vitamin tabs to put it in water and uh, I dug few. Uh, and uh, probably uh, my my neighbor who is a homeopath uh, doctor gave some uh, homeopathic pills saying that this will bring immunity. We ought to get out of trust. So the point here is that brings to what she asked is health and wellness. Today that's a buzzword. So my expectation next year is can we bring some discipline to this beautiful madness of health and wellness from a technical regulatory ecosystem perspective? I think that will be a beautiful subject. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And one last question with this we conclude. Uh, Tarun, counterintuitive, half crazy idea. What do you think of that? So, so, so I, I mean, hard to say, but I think I, I was just thinking about it. Uh, what could be uh, going back on something? So, there is a lot of conversation today, uh, natural uh, things, ingredients which are trustable, natural, etc. But uh, what could change, uh, maybe what if there was uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning into what we do, uh, into the same thing and to provide different solutions using that, using the same natural ingredients. So I'm saying natural ingredients have to be used the way they are and therefore you want to preserve their naturalness but there could be some crazy things and a lot of that has not been exploited fully. There are some opportunities, we may not go towards a, uh, GMO side, but there are technologically uh, opportunities which could uh, dramatically shift some of those uh, opportunities. So I'm saying there could be some uh, things which uh, come back and you know we say that okay we want to move towards more natural, more trusted, more traceable uh, natural things. But could there be a uh, ingredients where which is based on technology, based on new science that we uh, you know new learnings that we get and can be applied, uh, new extractions, and some of those could be uh, very uh, 
could be ways of conversations for in the future. So thanks a lot. I will just give you one crazy uh, business idea someone has already put up in UK. There is this uh, vitamin shops. Uh, you actually, uh, it's, a, it's a restaurant, but you need to go and lie down in a bed. They put uh, the vitamin shots in your veins. You uh, sleep in your, you, you stay in the bed for the next half an hour, 40 minutes, and then you go back. So, <laughs> so some startup, uh, you can, it's, it's something you can Google, and there are plenty of business happening in that trend, in, especially in Europe. I but, just, yeah. Yeah, I just have one thought, and I was thinking, uh, you know, as you were talking. I think one of the things that the Indian industry can do to be on a global stage, I think there are some learnings, and I just thought of these. So one example is uh, everyone's seen this uh, ad of mutual uh, funds association, which they have the ad, and they're not afford any specific mutual fund, they're just going to mutual fund. Similarly, if you look at olive oils, the way they were evolved in India is that the associations have got together and built that. Uh, or California, Amundsen. A lot of these things. So when we want to play a global stage, I think we need to get a lot of things that we talked about the ingredients, technology side, but also a lot of our companies, small, medium, large, contribute and demonstrate what can we really do. So when we go abroad and we also build those opportunities, and they they could be really a big uh, play that we could have outside India as well, saying that look, these are the things. Ashwakanda has become a big in, uh, say, US, but uh, it's that somebody has picked up, but can we have a concerted effort uh, by associations, by group of people, who have st stakeholders to build it forward, and there's clearly an opportunity. So that, I thought, uh, just happened to me, maybe a good uh, thing for us to really look at is when we want to be playing in a global uh, conversations on food. With the import, with the GFT, with the customs, with the trade perspective. Those challenges of the food union sector will be taken up uh, uh, through this forum. And we are also working very closely on the smart food union sector, and soon there will be some formal announcement. Uh, we are creating a center for excellence for the smart food union sector that will come probably in a month time. We will get an uh, We are working with the Good Food Institute GFI on this, and uh, soon we will announce to you. Thank you so much for, uh, to my esteemed panelists, Mr. Sarao, Mr. Adi Bakar, Mr. Tarman Roda, Mr. Grover. I really look forward to meeting you in person, sir, in future. And once again, thank you so much. Uh, we will not break, we will straight away start the next session. And uh, allow my team to take uh, just two minutes time to change over the... I see a beverage leader committee for IFF. Uh, Mr. Milin Narlekar, sales set, test and welding at UDR. And Mr. Koshal Vesna, this is Magic Feature Answer Limited. Uh, thanks to all the esteemed panel members for joining us for the session. Uh, now, may I request Mr. Badri Nar, the auditor session, please take the listen forward. Thank you very much. May I request everyone to take the seats, please? With Sarah Badri, I'd like to introduce my panelists, uh, four of us, and uh, me, very briefly, uh, we are part of this company first slash direct actually, it was actually direct in the earlier, and we have just changed the big question that's first as well. Uh, we started off at, uh, uh, in part of the way down in south, uh, started off as uh, the way that we start off with any back office garage operation actually, different food products, uh, tabletop exhibits. And uh, we have built up a team around that. We have uh, probably, I'm not sure whether someone is contested, we have about 45 food signs based on us in our group. Food processing as well as uh, there's a lot of demand addition in wheat. Uh, he's a postgraduate from biological science. And he started off with a career right off the computer system. That's very fortunate. Thank you very much for joining us, and again, uh, he will be giving more insights into how the agriculture as well as the value chain is about living in India. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. And my next, uh, Mihir Joshi, uh, he has been with IFF for quite some time, and uh, he has been instrumental in carrying on the R&D work as well with the IFF product and the marketing product. So uh, he will be throwing some insights onto the consumer insights of the, on the industry side of the flavors. 
uh, he brings in uh, the DuPont experience as well, uh, with the regional as well as the global trends. And uh, he has been very instrumental in the South, uh, South Asian food and beverage industry. So thank you very much for being on the panel. And my third speaker, Mr. Milan Narenka. Uh, he has been with uh, Tudorong and uh, you know, very much into the accounts and the redistribution part of it. And we have been with a very close client interactions and developing the client profile for Tudorong as well. And we have been in 20 years with Tudorong. Uh, uh, that's very unusual for this generation. We got to teach everyone. <laughs> So, uh, very much focused on the B2B side. So, thank you very much for being in the panel as well. And my last, Mr. Toshin Vaishnav, thank you very much for being part of it. And uh, we have been very instrumental in introducing uh, very good ingredients before we have to India. Uh, and it has been a very good journey right from start as well. And uh, he has been a business manager with uh, Chris Hansen. Uh, and a very kind of a pioneer in uh, probiotics in a lot of the cultures as well. And uh, he has been a daily technologist, very qualified daily technologist, and that's a primary area of focus for probiotics as well. And I'd like to have his opinion also in terms of how how the ingredient space is moving more towards other than daily and breaking and all the other aspects how it is going to grow in the future. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, just briefly, before we start off the discussion, uh, my earlier session, I'm sure that almost 90% of the points are covered on the train side of it. And we would like to throw some light into what we see as being the sort of trend in the last few years. I won't say really one or two years, a few years. How wellness has played a role in terms of packaged food as of now. What kind of new products have incorporated certain new ingredients? And what has been the sort of a feedback from those products? Just briefly, that won't take too much of time. Probably five or six slides. If I uh, can bring you a slide. I uh, hope you can see that. I'm trying my best to. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, last few years, don't have to read with how challenging it was for the food industry as well as the food ingredients. And one of the, uh, personally, one of the key points that was underlying in all that, there were not many, not many fake ingredients coming into the market. I don't have to say the very important point in that. All these kind of uh, the, the happenings, the fake ingredients can play havoc in the society. You can say it could be any kind of uh, snake oil kind of ingredient, it could be any ingredient. And it's FLC have done a very common test role in terms of making sure there's false claims, they will stay. That's a very, very good role that they have played. And making sure that whoever had a false claim, even let us say a small shop where they claim that yeah, you, will, you consume this, you will have immediate immunity, you will have immediate cure for COVID. Those things are immediately taken action. That's a very, very proactive way that the has done a damn good job of that. And because of that, the science-based ingredients had a chance. A very good chance. In terms of proteins, or probiotics, in terms of even any of those ingredients that are traditional, like including the, the starches as well. So some of them I'd like to point out here what kind of ingredients in vogue. I won't say in terms of it has been growing fantastically or in terms of volumes, but I would say that any kind of a all natural claim, it had a very good impact on the consumer. And including the fibers right now. Anyone who had a high fiber? And those are very important claims. And especially those who are sitting at home and a lot of food being consumed, you gotta have a sugar control. And the high fiber played a very good role in terms of sugar control. So those kind of uh, products, they played a very good role. Natural flavors. I'm sure that Jiolong and IFR, they should be very much in the forefront 
financial flavors, they have been very, very well received. And you have the traditional flavors as well. Uh, so many of them, uh, including uh, most of the households, they are used to the Ayurvedic and the herbal kind of flavors that is either given as a concoction or they have been given more as a kind of a remedy. Those kind of flavors also, they play a very good part. Others, like the high protein, vitamin and mineral, traditionally they have been given to a lot of fortified, a lot of foods that also play a very good part. Sugar reducing. This is probably the first time that sugar came out in the forefront in terms of reducing of sugars. That is a very, very important part that has taken up in the last few years. And to get into what kind of a products were introduced with those kind of ingredients, uh, there were a lot of products which were introduced recently that included the vitamins and minerals, especially the Tata salt kind of products, a common commodity. There were a lot of uh, immunology, zinc, iron, and other, other minerals were used. And we have these kind of cookies and biscuits that came up as well. So that has been a very, very important trend for a lot of the biscuit manufacturers. And of course, the breakfast cereals, Kellogg's and the fruit groups, they will produce a lot of these uh, multi grain as well as the vitamins and minerals uh, addition to it. So essentially, fortification came to the front stage. That is a very, very important kind of an aspect that has developed in the last few years. And just moving on, uh, some of the other products, uh, in terms of the herbals and botanical extracts, they were also in the forefront. So what happened was, including any of the processed food, as well as the households, they started using herbals and botanical extracts as a kind of a cure, as well as, as a kind of how uh, they can get over the COVID situation. So these were some of the tracks in terms of how the ingredients have started playing and more and more we can see such trends into many of the products. Not just packaged, it will be more towards household goods, household uh, cooking as well, as well as intermediary products where you have all these uh, hotels and uh, uh, the blends also coming in. So ingredients will start to play a very, very major role. We are just looking at the beginning of it. To summarize, yeah, that is what we would like to discuss some more points in terms of how we are going to look at ingredients can play from a consumer perspective, how it is happening. I'd like to throw some points and uh, have the panelists uh, respond to them. The giants I have referred to about in terms of taste is paramount and completely uh, it has been ruling the food industry, apart from the price of course, and the taste has been in the forefront. What do you think has happened in the last few years with the taste and with the health ingredients also coming in? What do you think is the change? How does the consumer feel about that? Yeah. So, my good question. Yeah. Hello. So, uh, if you look at overall uh, packaged food industry, the way it is growing, so yes, uh, with the awareness coming in a lot of uh, on the social media as well as on the other platforms, yes, consumers are more inclined towards a lot of these nutritional products. And you would truly agree with me that more and more nutritious product that is that is bad that bad it starts tasting. Why? Because nutritional product also bring in their own uh, characteristics into it, and that is where the real challenge lies with the manufacturers and the R and D team there. So, and end of the day, taste is the ultimate thing. I mean, consumers would buy a product with a nutritional claim or a functional claim in the market, but then until and unless it does not taste good, consumer would not go for a repeat buy. So, that is how important it is for a, whichever product which is there in market to taste good. So, that is where the real uh, expertise of ours bring, uh, come in picture. I mean, we try really play around with the different masters and other things to ensure that all those off notes which are coming from nutritional product are in mask. And thereafter, we try and give, you a, give a product which is much more indulgent in taste so that uh, whenever the consumer is tasting, the health conscious consumer is tasting, they are also not deprived of the actual taste, tasty product. Obviously, we understand they need to, they are looking for a specific nutrition 
But then yes, they are looking for a tasty nutrition. I would put it. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Milan. And uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our views. Uh, I think uh, very critically, I think the most important thing that I would probably share as a principle from our role as ingredient suppliers on the whole taste versus health is to say, hey, let's make it taste and health. Uh, because primarily, that's when we're going to get big traction on all the interest to the consumers have. What I would probably say today is, from a consumer perspective first, that a lot of consumers are showing interest for doing trials in products. So you go out, you buy a protein bar because certainly you want more protein in your system. Uh, you have two or three times, you realize it's not tasty. And you drop the idea. Who's lost out? Ingredient suppliers, of course, of protein have lost out. But so have uh, the food manufacturers. And overall, India on the health platform has lost out. So I think what's critical is that, and I believe that the ingredient suppliers have a far bigger role in this is to ensure that we help our partners, our customers, to deliver products which are not only wholesome, but also very tasty. And frankly, it's not such a difficult puzzle. It's a lot about, uh, for a lot of smaller customers especially, uh, becoming familiar with the technology, okay? uh, and B, also the fact that from our side, we have to give solutions which are essentially affordable to customers. Uh, and when we look at health, uh, we often tend to focus on positives. So we'll talk about high protein, uh, etc. And then we'll want it to put, put it on the label so that the customer can claim, he can have extra margins. We are happy because we are selling higher protein or we are selling masking solutions which help in making that protein taste better. But a bulk, if I may say, I look at India's biggest problem. So uh, the year back we did a massive research across India. Uh, to understand which are the big, um, biggest health issues that customers are facing. Number one on the list, no surprise for anybody, I think, is diabetes. Uh, almost 50% of people said that they are already suffering or they expect that it will hit them in a couple of years because somebody they are related to already has it and he has crossed 50 or something like that. Massive opportunity right, uh, to address this segment. What are we today doing in terms of creating those solutions for our customers uh, who are sitting here as well to deliver on products for these diabetic folks? Let's take beverages as an example. Are there beverages today in the market that are available that can address uh, this particular segment which is going to go massively? And this is not about adding protein. This is about taking away bad sugars. I will not say sugar, I will say bad sugars. Uh, and also taking away if, in not in case of beverages, but uh, let's say in other food products, fat. And this is what brings me to the second point. Uh, one is of course looking at what the consumer wants, but to make sure the consumer gets the product, you have to deliver the solution in a manner, we as an industry, that it makes sense for the customer to put it out there. And there I'll give an example, simple, 70% uh, of our uh, bakery that is consumed in India is through artisan bakers, small bakery shops. Now, the big brands are of course already making moves on trying to reduce both sugar and fat in their biscuits, all of their products. Who's talking to the artisan bakers? And how are you going to convince each individual artisan baker right, in moving to a low fat, low sugar solution? And the only way to do it is to make economic sense. So what we did, we did a lot of brainstorming last year with a product which is going to help them save almost 25% of their farm oil that they are going to use in creating those products. Now, for the artisan baker, he may not be really motivated to give a healthier product to his custom uh, consumer, but when I say, hey, with that 25% palm oil reduction, you are going to save X amount of money, he's going to jump on. And I think that's the mindset that we need to take when we say taste plus health. I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Thanks for it. I'd like to throw the same uh, on a different uh, platform with your lead. Uh, what do you think with the big food turn and the taste aspect towards the what, how, how are you coping with that? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. 
as I represent uh, natural energy and industry, then uh, my comments will be mainly, mainly <coughs> related to and focused on that. And uh, as of uh, your question, is concerned about the taste and the ingredients of the food. Uh, I understand that uh, let the food be your medicine and when we talk about the good health and through the food, uh, it has to be tasted good and acceptable, then only actually uh, we can deliver it to the population or the masses, I can say. Uh, yes, as uh, far as the ingredient uh, portfolio is concerned, and especially with uh, some health benefits and uh, some proven, I can say the clinical data and the research, the safety has been done, that it is not really as natural as it, it is expected to be. That if I say the Moringa, uh, we use Moringa in summer and most of the South Indian dishes. But when we take it as an ingredient, it is really not tasting as acceptable as it is uh, in a natural form. But then definitely it is actually uh, altogether our uh, responsibility as an industry to manufacture and provide the ingredients to make it the best adoptable and the tasty. So, in terms of uh, when we talk about the taste and health, definitely health is the first, but to deliver it, uh, to, uh, to get a healthy benefit, it has to be uh, you know, the best acceptable and the good in taste. So, definitely we all together can do it, like uh, in the first session I had from, uh, uh, sir from you, that we all together can make the things more acceptable. Most of the natural ingredients, we, when we taste it, when we, when we incorporate in uh, the product, uh, it changes the taste, color, flavor, but there are other ways to make it uh, the better. Yeah. Uh, do you see any kind of a change in trend in the last, let's say, three, four years, that people have changed the taste in some way, or they've adapted to some changes in taste because it is healthy? Do, do you see any change in your product portfolio or development of products? Yeah, definitely, because uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Mahir Joshi told that the people are accepting uh, the bad, the bitter taste also because uh, they need the good health. Uh, we have seen that uh, during the COVID, uh, we, we were, most of the Indian population were taking some, uh, you know, kada kind of things, which was not very tasty. But because we need to be safe and uh, to be healthy, then we have, the most of the population accepted that. The same way in, in the European and the US market, the turmeric latte was very popular, still it is. And it contains the turmeric. Although it has a flavor of turmeric, it has a taste of the flavor of the turmeric, but still it is acceptable because it is delivering the good health. So uh, it is vice versa, but still, if it is good taste, it is more acceptable. Thank you. That's glad to hear that, guys. That's a good thing for margins for a lot of the industries as well. Uh, and uh, apparently, uh, if it's not tasty, it is yet healthy, it becomes a compulsion, which is a medication. So, uh, what what we have foreseen, uh, and uh, or what we have, I would say, trend is retrospective, what we have observed, in a way. And uh, there is a third element, which is a trade-off element, which is the convenience. That is what we always see. And, when I bring this convenience in, it is taste and health which is more of a driver when there is an element of fear. Vitamin C was going off the shelf when there was a fear. Now with double vaccination then probably the fear element or the uncertainty in the element has reduced in terms of mortality rates. And that's where we are back to the convenience side of it. So there is, there is a trade-off that we potentially see in, in the segments uh, that we deal with. Thank you very much. That, that brings to the next point in terms of the game, in terms of the taste of this health. Uh, in your product, in the last few years, uh, the kind of uh, texturizer or any of, any of your uh, probiotics that is used, uh, do you see uh, complete customization in terms of the Indian environment for your taste as well as the uh, health of the, do you see any changes in the, the last few years? Yeah, so uh, uh, obviously, obviously there is a lot of uh, island diversification that we see in the segment that we operate. Our, our segment of operation is core TV at this point of time. Uh, yes, uh, so I would put it this way. 
that uh, what is yoga to the Western world is dahi to us. And, and, and uh, we do have an organized segment which does cater to that segment. But then there is a staunch level of acceptance of certain degrees of flavors or conotions or acidities which are associated with products like that. So uh, th there is a strong Indian connect. It's not that, uh, it, unlike uh, some of the other countries like China, where dairy was not an inherent part of the diet, dairy is a very inherent part of India. And there, there is a strong, strong uh, historical group connection with some of our traditional products. It's all about industrializing them. On the other hand, products like cheese, uh, India is more and more processed cheese today. And apparently, uh, it's not that uh, we have kind of cooked into the Buddha or the Chittas of the world. So there is a very specific uh, Indian thing that happens in India. The flavors and all, this can be enhanced. So I'm really happy that uh, this point has been put up. Thank you. Just, <coughs> sorry, just to add on this, uh, as you are already working with the millets, then you may know that government has already initiated a program to promote that kind of things. Yes. And we as an uh, ingredient manufacturer, we also try to uh, do a bit on that to <coughs> make those ingredients acceptable. Uh, whether it is, say, isolating some of the parts or making the good combination of the different millets because there are a few different kinds of millets. And you can have an, uh, you know the, the portions of it so that it makes a complete food in terms of uh, either the, uh, the protein part or the mineral vitamins whatever it contains because it is the, it is the richer source of you know the different kind of food ingredients and I think that will help and then uh, because uh, as you told that you are on a startup you may need uh, support from the academia and the industries to resolve it and uh, as I understand the food companies the big giants are already uh, working a lot on that. Uh, maybe uh, someone is there to help you and uh, you know get the right product to the consumer. The customers, the consumers are nowadays very much aware they want to have a healthy kind of a claim on the back and in order to meet those claim conditions you need to add X amount of a particular ingredient. Now we have got so many unique ingredients and uh, we have experienced uh, uh, using uh, DHA, uh, green tea extract when it comes to herbal, uh, white kidney bean extract, uh, could be omega-3. So these are all very popular ingredients, uh, comes with a lot of health claims. But if, if in case you want to put a claim on your label, you need to add an X amount. And if you add that X amount, the taste goes haywire. So it's a tricky task for the flavor houses. We have worked with a lot of flavor houses, uh, Javedan, Taka Sago, Permanent, all the flavor houses. So it's a task for them as well to make the product tastier so that the consumer accepts it. We are giving healthy nutrition profile, healthy ingredients, but if taste is not good, the product is not gonna work in the market. And the moment you work on the flavors, you give these special flavors, the cost is an issue. So how do we arrest all these three things together? I want to give the claim to the consumer. I wanted to give them the desired amount in order to get that health claim. I wanted to have a better sensory product. And at the same time, I want to have a economical, I would not say too economical, but it should be in the reach of the uh, normal consumers who can buy this product and do the repurchase as well. So these are my three issues. Do get across a lot of these questions, and one of the major challenge what happens is, yes, uh, the prices would come down when you get the economy of scale, and when always there is a new thing coming up, the volumes are low. That is the reason the prices go high. But then yes, I can tell you, I mean, they have good flavor houses. Sapish sir also coming here, uh, one of the major flavor houses here. Trust me, over a period of time, uh, today I can tell you that a sugar reduction or a salt reduction, the technology, whatever we have claimed, earlier it used to be a cost, added cost for and above whatever mm -hmm. the supply. But then today over a period of time, a lot of R&D and work going across, I can say we are very well ready to give you a cost neutral solution. But then yes, there is a time period also and the demand should really go high, which will really help us. Uh, 
uh, in terms of giving you the value uh, for the price. Uh, just just a thought, thought, perspective here. Just a thought on uh, this. When you look at what you're saying, my first immediate reaction is there is no nothing to that, to be very honest. Uh, you can't have every, all 26 ingredients in and have it at one point. Uh, how we typically help customers tackle those problems is we try and zero in on who they are exactly trying to target. And for those pieces, what is the consumer willing to pay for? Uh, you'll be amazed how much of a big difference it makes because then we get into what with our customers what we call as a new design process. And there we start to really eliminate what is not being, uh, the customer is not willing to, so the consumer is not willing to pay for. And that actually eliminates a lot of cost at first stage. The second step, uh, when you start using technology, like he was exactly mentioning, and you factor in uh, from a risk appetite perspective that hey, this is going to scale up in X number of years, uh, then for sure those solutions can be found. So I would probably urge uh, everybody here, in fact, when you're trying to design a product, and when I say design a product, I don't mean uh, let's make a product with DHA in it as per the requirement, but more to all the features, functionality. Uh, you'll be looking at also the what it means to him from an emotional perspective. So, like you said, there are flavors which the kids will have, there are flavors the kids will not have. And we need to be uh, cognizant of that. There are also emotional appeals that come through. So you have to look at it from that angle. And in the same angle, there's this big social angle. And I'll give you a very interesting example that I heard in a consumer emotion. Uh, diabetic father, uh, you know this has been in research, his pain point, imagine he said, my I am diabetic, I try to control my diabetes, I have diabetic biscuits for diabetic products. He has a kid, toddler, four year old. This kid wants to eat everything that he eats. Whenever he sits down to eat. Very natural, right? But he can't give it to them because most of them, those products are not different. And if somebody were to design a product which he could share with his family, imagine the amount he would be willing to pay for that. The premium would pay for that. That is the depth that you would have to go into for food data, and then you will probably be able to uh, arrive at a win-win for all three, the customer, the consumer, and the winning company. That's what's part of your Neutralizers. Neutralizers won't have much, you know, high costs as such in which a flavor might have. What if we use neutralizers, which neutralizes the strong taste, retains all the things, and even if it's not flavoring it. Flavoring means all to the bring it in, and that can be a new market for the flavor companies. What's your say on this? You can say uh, certainly, but and we can look at fundamentally changing the product, or you can look at the marketing angle as well. If you notice, all four of them are from marketing. They are absolutely they know the market very well. They are the gospel of market as of now. So there is no one solution. There are plenty of solutions. They are just giving some points where you can look at it as what we can do to fine tune the product. So, sorry to say this, but we, there are any number of solutions. That could be to do with the product itself, or it could be with the marketing. You can, if you are perseverance in terms of making sure that the taste, this is the taste, this is what my product is, if you like it, you take it, you can succeed as well. It is possible. So, there is no one particular solution. I would back with uh, Mahir on that. And, uh, to your question on what could be possible, there could be any number of combinations. You have to work with the product, with the market, and try to get the best combinations. Yeah, yeah but uh, sorry, just to add on, uh, you know, because uh, your concern was especially from like the DC and most of the natural ingredients who are definitely tasting different from what are acceptable taste like. But uh, in the first session, and uh, CEO, FS, right, CEO, uh, Mr. Tinker also mentioned uh, the delay release or the encapsulation of uh, the DHA or any kind of ingredient, and otherwise uh, the right selection of the product format which has to be delivered. I will give you an example of uh, getting an acarmate, which is endothelite. This is the king of beta, basically. And it's a very good antiviral. We uh, had an, a clinical uh, trials on uh, the COVID, and it's a very good result. But then again, was a very, very bitter taste of that. So uh, we definitely work out and uh, then made an application to molecule out of it, which 
uh, is not tasting bitter because it is not dissolving in the mouth. So uh, it definitely doesn't taste anything. But when it goes inside uh, in the stomach and uh, you know the absorption and the digestion part, uh, the outer cell releases and uh, it works like it has to be. So it means there are different, uh, as uh, Mr. Badrinath told you, there could be a different kind of solutions, uh, especially but in our ingredients, this is uh, one thing capsulation to make it uh, really, really to change the product formats and definitely adding some you know, neutralizer of flavors kind of thing. So there could be a different way to find out the solution. Sure. Uh, if we can move on uh, with the next uh, part, of, if there is any other major concern, we can take it up as a discussion or we can move on with the next point in terms of how we are looking at ingredients in the last few years. And one of the key things, everyone is used to, if you have any comorbidities, that's, that has become a buzzword in the last few years in terms of the, uh, whatever the vaccinations and the COVID have been happening. Uh, the comorbidities in terms of the key aspect of what, what Mahe was saying earlier with the diabetes part of it. And uh, with uh, what has happened in the trend, a lot of home cooking happened and some, a lot of Swiggy also play, played in uh, with a lot of deliveries as well. How the comorbidities affected the ingredients especially? Some of them, like the fibers, were the obvious ones. The soluble insoluble fibers, they played a very crucial role in terms of making it to the front of the pack. Uh, is there any other comorbidities that you can think of and where it played a crucial role in the last three years? Where it could be the ashwagandha or the turmeric or, or it could be the fibers or it could be the proteins. Is there anything else that you can think of or is there any prime mover for the ingredients? I'll start off with another one. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, say turmeric, right, from turmeric to honey, to in the oils also, oil space also, the way olive oil ventured in from kitchens, Indian mm -hmm. kitchen, that itself speaks uh, the drastic change at our, the consumer mindset. We wanted to live friendly, we wanted to have a holistic approach towards the health. Uh, so, yes, COVID has further uh, intensified the fact that every consumer now wants to get into uh, prevent uh, nutrition kind of thing rather than getting into the diagnostic, post-diagnostic they would go for medicine. So, yes, consumers now are looking how they avoid the medication and get into a side which is more of a prevent uh, nutrition. So that is the time when consumers are looking for all these products. That is what I would ask. Uh, probably I think the immediate ingredient that comes to my mind is uh, protein. Uh, in the last few years, India has almost been on protein fever. Now working in the COVID, but uh, that's the kind of interest that we have seen from consumers and customers in terms of uh, consuming products which are high in protein as well as launching products which are high in protein. Traditionally, if you looked at the high protein products, you were thinking that which is Now, today, I mean, it's gone to even snacks for that matter. It's available in yeah. biscuit format or even chips. I mean, who would associate with potato chip <laughs> uh, protein? But people are attempting those things because there is a demand for the market for that. So I would probably think immediately that has had a massive impact. And to your point, front of the pack, when it says, Six gram protein or eighteen gram protein. That's a good for a lot of people. Yeah, high protein, high fiber. Yeah. 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 Very common. Yes, definitely because uh, when we are discussing with the last two years, especially the COVID period, uh, it was actually the time when, uh, as uh, in the earlier session was mentioned, that it was the time when we realized the importance of health, especially in uh, Indian scenario, I would like to say, and uh, then changed a lot of things. You know, when, uh, I think the first three or the six months, everybody enjoyed at home cooking some sweets, some different kind of foods, and you know, eating a lot. Uh, suddenly, uh, there was a buzz of about uh, immunity, then we took an akala, hardy, whatever we could do. And uh, once the feed passed, and then we thought of we are getting a little longer uh, fat, uh, we are having some other uh, lifestyle problems, so whether it is uh, uh, you know, the diabetes or something else. 
you know, and uh, then finally, uh, after one year, we, uh, means definitely it is a global phenomenon that there is a cognitive health problem uh, because of this all uh, lifestyle and food changes. Uh, during, uh, and see, uh, in Indian countries, I would uh, definitely I would, uh, like to refer uh, the way of uh, living in an in Indian culture, which is either you can refer to the Ayurveda also, which is basically the way of uh, living healthy life, right? So uh, there we, we used to uh, eat in a food and definitely that act as a medicine so that we avoid different kind of things. But now because of that and because of the different lifestyle, we need you know the cooked food and definitely uh, that has changed you know from cooking uh, at home to be in a ready made uh, food. This, uh, there was a need and that has been catered by the industry very well uh, by providing the different product formats, the healthy product format also. And uh, during the time what I personally assume and I realized that we had a lot of time to you know read to understand uh, what immunity is, what the product is, what they are claiming and then now we are more concerned about if I buy something at least and if they are claiming, uh, at least I try to find out why and how they are claiming it. So the labeling part is also uh, you know which I think the customer are now aware of and definitely want to know that uh, if it is written, why? And how it can be, uh, uh, highly matter if it is a little bit costlier, but if it is something claimed, then they want to know, that they are more aware about it. So, uh, uh, you know, the labeling part, the food habit changes, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the ingredient, and all the industry has been changed, and which has been accepted by the uh, end consumer itself. And uh, the overall, it is good uh, that uh, you know the good things are coming, and then even uh, our habits as a customer, as a consumer, our habits are also changing, and we are also curious to know uh, if it is really good or not. So this this is actually the whole change happened during this uh, this phase, the last two or three years. Yeah, also I think that as you said about the science-based ingredients, they really played a very good part in terms of making sure the assuring the consumer they yeah. getting the right product. Yeah, uh, I would just like to add on and share uh, with you guys because uh, we are sitting here with, uh, you know, then the uh, FSSI CEO, Mr. Samir, has supported a lot to the industry. Uh, we had an, uh, one uh, live example with us that uh, we had an ingredient and we were working for the last three years in a different stages of other safety and clinicals, human clinicals, that has been already approved globally. And the only hurdle was that it was not approved under the FSSI. But uh, with the, all the documentation and with all the, uh, the data they required, that has been approved uh, in the last uh, week only. And it is now uh, available for the Indian market and for the global market. So this is, you know, uh, the innovative ingredient and, uh, you know, the authorities all together, I mean, the industry and the authorities all together working where we can deliver the good ingredients to the uh, end consumer. Quite a few things have been covered in general, but what, what I would like to kind of add to uh, the ingredients that we could see and the forefront for it uh, last couple of years. Uh, they were, the, so, the consumer ingredients uh, like herbals at home was very common. And, uh, I mean, a packaged Deloitte kind of a product also was easily available. So, from, from that perspective, it was immunity. And uh, uh, from the threat perspective, for our product was immunity in the digestive system became very important during those major times. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you mentioned and, uh, and, uh, curcumin. The turmeric was there already. So there was an attempt uh, an industry to exploit it to a curcumin based flavor milk or even curcumin based ice cream as well as a launch. So yes, we could try and see that 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 attempt was being made uh, from a from a digestive and immunity perspective. Uh,
they said the first thing the doctor told them after they were diagnosed was no package pet. So suddenly losing a consumer who was consuming a lot of food. Package beverage is gone for a brand. How are you going to still fulfill his need uh, in a way is something that is being shown through practice thus far. Similar to one of the other challenges and from a slightly separate industry is profile. Profile is in my view, when you did well, it should have been. Profile is success. And definitely there are some gaps in somewhere in the industry in terms of which you are able to really harness profile. I think that is that is where this platform plays a very very crucial role. When you have a platform like this, you can address these uh, as taking it as an individual. So it will be a big challenge in terms of convincing the consumers generally about the package bill. And in India, in terms of the all said and done, ultimately the per capita consumption of package goods is not as much as what you compare it to the rest of the world. And key reason there are plenty of reasons. Freshness is one of the reasons that we feel if it is packaged, it's not fresh. If it is unpackaged, it is fresh. No matter what it is, it is fresh. So those are the kind of things that the platform like this, we can take it up and then address those issues commonly. And a uh, long time, FSSA was advertising more in terms of uh, the package code is good for you. And they have somehow that's slightly discontinued now, but something like that. And looking at the ingredient as well a similar kind of a platform. Could be a starter in terms of how you can build some confidence with the public that, okay, if you are having a turmeric fresh or turmeric package, both the same, it is good. And those kind of messages, I'm sure that will play a positive role. Uh, it's not a shortcut, it's, it's something that, if you keep on doing it over a period of time, I think that will be a kind of uh, interesting thing. And uh, uh, I mean, talking about some of the markets outside, say the, the difference between uh, how it is perceived, uh, the ingredients are perceived here than ingredients versus other countries. Let's you know, say, for example, uh, any kind of yeast extract, it is very common. And nobody takes it in Indonesia, and other, they don't take it as a kind of uh, ingredient or it is part of the food. Whereas in India, if you talk about yeast extract, it's chemical. What are we talking about? Why are you using it? In, my product, whatever it is. So those kind of misconceptions, it has to slightly be done as a kind of exercise that this platform should reassure yeast extract or any other ingredient is good because it is approved by FLSAI. The whole science has been approved. It is, there is a background to it. So those kind of messages, it's a right forum. This is something that can be taken up and passed on continuously. It's not going to be a one-time exercise that, okay, you say it and then you fire about it. You got to do it continuously with some kind of uh, uh, pillars supporting it in terms of the ingredient, in terms of the food industry, in terms of the regulatory. If all those pillars come up, I think those things can be established. In the minds of the industry, these are the minds of the consumers, uh, plus so much of this specific uh, line being uh, given out by the health coaches and by the doctors these days that whatever ingredients you cannot read, do not buy that product. Now it is really coming into the hindrance of genuine food producers and people want to hear from us that we do not put chemicals. While we try our level best to put out the word that we do not put any harmful chemicals. All that I want to hear is that there are zero additives, zero any ingredient and still they do want to buy market food, you know, packaged food. So, what is the real definition of clean food, if, uh, clean ingredient if there is any? That is what my, one of my concerns is, if I can put it to the panel. Ingredients and the clean label, yeah. please go ahead. Uh, so, very interesting question and uh, there's a funny stats. So, we did this run of ingredients purely just the name that consumers will read the ingredients study these were healthy ingredients, uh, giving them some kind of health benefit. When they read the name, they went like 50% said okay, I tried, 50% said no. The moment we explained the benefit, the line statement we gave this is the health benefit, it jumped to 90% for most places. Uh, so then it becomes a question of familiarizing our consumers with those kind of health ingredients that are already present 
and assuring them that they are there for their benefit. So it probably has to come down to, if I may say, uh, ingredient positioning of products. Uh, very common outside as well, where in the first few initial years, what is done is when a new ingredient is launched with some effect, let's say, as an example like this. Uh, when you talk about it on the pack, saying, hey, this is the, this is going to help you manage your GI index of the whole sugar so that the sugar is not digested immediately, but over a period of time and stuff like that. I think that is something that between food ingredient manufacturers and food manufacturers we have to work out how we actually do it on the labels. Uh, we call them uh, clean ingredient when we are not adding anything. Say, we take it in ashwagandha or we take it in curcumin out of turmeric. So when it is uh, just uh, an ingredient uh, out of uh, the raw material, it is generally called a clean ingredient. But technically, if I say uh, we have used some solvent to extract it out from the earth, and then what kind of solvent it is, whether it is the water, maybe we can call it uh, clean. If it is ethanol, maybe we can call it uh, clean. But frankly speaking, there are most or the most of the active ingredients are not extracted with water or sometimes with uh, a single uh, solvent. Then uh, we, may be, uh, we may be using some different kind of or combination of solvents to extract out of it. Uh, then does it really uh, again clean? I'm sorry, I'm not uh, giving a clear answer, but I'm just trying to explain what the situation is when we talk about the clean ingredient. Yes, uh, definitely when we extract uh, ashwagandha with uh, the water or the any ingredient, uh, it, is, it can be called as a clean one. But uh, then again, when, see, a clean means we are not adding anything, additives, carriers, or anything out of it. But processing the cat here will be an important part, then, right? So that again, how to define clean is very important. From where we are starting to say clean. Our product may push the SA clean board, or how we have processed it, that the process hole is going through, and then we are calling it uh, clean. So, that is means these are the few points uh, to decide how clean your ingredient and your product is. Uh, we are leaving you here. Sir. Thank you very much, Ashwan. That's, uh, that's also a valid uh, kind of a definition. So that can add, uh, what, what do you think about? The domestic way of cooking and meal way of looking at clean ingredients, what do you think about it? Uh, I have, so let, let's say slightly looking at it from a, you know, the marketing or consumer perspective, uh, the decision making is uh, in a family is no more restricted to adults of buying food. The, the influencers are as, as low as a 10 year old kid also is an influencer at this point of time in a family. And uh, uh, so, when we say from the from this point perspective of ingredients and nutrition, uh, the way we see is two ways. One is addition of certain things, and second is absence of or no, no additions. Some of the segments that that we see is a product like dahi is a very clean label, all natural. The connotation that we get most of the time is that it's just milk, it is fermented milk. The moment you take it into uh, yogurt formats with added stuffs, the list of things comes into the flow. It, it can also be clean label. I am not telling that uh, it won't be clean label. But then that, that's, where, that's where the perception of a consumer kind of feels slightly different. A cheese, a natural cheese, or a paneer is, is a connotation that you will have. The moment you start seeing processed cheese, my friends from I say won't be very happy with that part of it, but then the moment you start seeing that a lot of salts and additives are there, uh, then there, there's a connotation that goes there. So uh, that's the way we, we see it from a trend Thank you. Thank you very much. And by the way, clean and natural are the most controversial statements in the <laughs> audience for the participation as well. Thank you very much. Which is more on the uh, regulatory side, and uh, we have the panel members as Dr. Jaspreet Singh from IFL, Dr. Venkatesh from Data Consumers, Ms. Tadichi Kapoor from Kevin Videos, Mr. Soman Singh from Pure Circle, and Mr. Raghuvendra Broker from Harvest Plus.